I'd like to call this the Tuesday, September the 8th, 2009 meeting of the Perkett County Board of Commissioners to order. And at 5.30 this afternoon, the board met with our Economic Development Board to, to discuss their strategic plan and ideas and policies that will go forward to guide this board. At this time, I'd like to ask the Reverend Bill Ralph if he'll come forward, lead us in our invocation, and then lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. At one of my churches, I had a man who uh, owned a Christian bookstore. A lady called and wanted a Bible. He said, honey, there are lots of different Bibles. She said, I don't want the King James Version. The other one called and said, I'd like to have a cross. And uh, he said, there are lots of crosses. But uh, he said, she said, I, I don't want one with a little man on it. So there's a lot of uh, people who, who think religion but don't know a whole lot about it. I'm always sad when I come to a place where I know most people don't know where they're going to spend eternity. Uh, they've done a beautiful job in their retirement, but they haven't done much of a job for what happens after retirement. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for these men and women who have given their time and sacrificed their time away from their families in doing your work. We thank you for the privilege of living in such a wonderful land, in such a wonderful state, in such a wonderful county. And Lord, we give you the credit for it all. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda this evening is the approval of the agenda. There's no additions or corrections to be made to it at this time. We have a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Idle, second by Commissioner O'Neill. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item number two is public comment period. This is an opportunity for the general public uh, to address the Board of Commissioners and the county on any item that's not on tonight's agenda for public hearing. We ask that your remarks be courteous and civil, and we'll ask the county attorney to provide a timekeeping service of three minutes. We have one person signed up to speak, and that's Commissioner Taylor. Uh, yeah, I didn't, this isn't, we just, are flooding in Moya, so I didn't prepare a statement, so I'll try to keep it under three real quick. Um, I just wanted to bring the attention. I know that the board is aware that we are working in some ditches in Quail Run and in the Moya district, but today there are people in the Quail Run subdivision, I haven't heard any place else, that can literally not get out of their homes. And um, I'm very concerned. I've talked to the county manager today. I will make a phone call this evening after our meeting to find if they are um, still unable to get out and I just want to bring it to the board's attention and also requesting that um, these people need to be checked on by emergency services if there's the parents luckily the bus drove down there this morning made a pathway for the cars to follow because it pushed the water away that they could get to uh, their children to Quinn Ridge Road to get on the bus I talked to a lady that came in my shop this evening who was very upset because she told me she could not get home tonight because the road that she traveled out this morning, um, the water was so high that she couldn't drive back down it. Um, I know that, Ben, you've got a couple of pictures, and I know that Eric's here. I know he loves me picking on him. But if you can, Eric, explain it a little bit better. Yes, Eric. I have gone back and rode with um, Mike, Eric and I have talked about it, and he has shown me how these ditches go, how they flow, where they're supposed to go to. Um, the corrective work that's being done now on a main ditch that is at the um, eastern, the beginning of Quail Run, that was running really good, and talking to the lady that lives on Beechwood, 
or Birchview, sorry, her end of the street, which is close to that ditch, had drained. The biggest part of that drainage problem, though, is it is supposed to go on the west side of Quail Run Drive and go down that ditch. It's, but. You, you're close. You, you're doing pretty good. Uh, Eric Weatherly, county engineer. And um, this map is uh, something I've heard Mike preach on over and over. The six major outfalls for the Moyoc drainage district. And you can see the six. Now, what Commissioner Taylor was talking about are primarily ditches four, five, and six. Those drain under, they drain Quail Run under Tolls Creek, under, uh, uh, under Puddin Ridge Road and out to Moyot Creek. And the, they're fl they flow, they flow good, but they don't flow flat fast enough. We had six inches of rain last night in six hours, which is a huge storm. But I've heard Mike say over and over, if we make these ditches bigger, they'll carry it faster. And to make it dip bigger, we've got to have access to these ditches. And that's our primary bottleneck right now, is getting access to make these ditches big enough to carry this water. So that's, that's where we're at. I think a question I asked you tonight too was, uh, who actually is in charge of the culverts that are on these roads? Um, if you talk to the State Department, they are, they're dots. They're supposed to be state maintained. That's the right of way there. Um, some of those have been because of the what was used. They're flat. So now where you had an 8-inch pipe under the driveway, it, you reduced it down to just a couple of inches because it's been flattened, run over, you know, by cars or whatever. But I would just like this board to be aware of it. Also, I would like for this board to direct staff to see if they cannot come up with a solution to this problem. I know that this happens now. Uh, I mean, that it, this is, you know, out of the norm for it. But my concern is for those people who are stuck in those homes who can't get out um, and if they have a need, where are they to go to? And I feel that it's our responsibility. Ms. Kenny, one of those first. Pardon me? Ms. Kenny. Ms. Kenny. Yes, but she's, her actually, she was the um, part of that ditch they've already cleared out and they're working towards Puddin Ridge Road. She talked when I talked to her this afternoon. Her end of the road had actually um, was starting to clear up. You could actually see the road. The problem is the water goes in that road and it goes two separate ways. If you bring that map back up one more second, it's okay. All right. If you look on that where it says Quail Run right there, and then that line right above it. To the right of that, do you see those two separate arrows? They're heading opposite directions. Water is flowing to Puddin Ridge, which is to the left of what we're looking at, and the other is flowing to the right, which goes out back behind Food Line and then down that ditch there. The problem with that, halfway through that, where those streets are, there's a coming to that last ditch on the bottom, that water is half of that is supposed to flow back to that. So that's also now a concern is it's not flowing. I know people tell me water doesn't flow north. Well, it does. And it flows any way it wants to so that it can get out. So that's another concern. So we're working on one ditch. Um, we've uh, worked on uh, one of the other ditches and got that. And when I looked at both of those today, they were flowing. I mean, like a river, they were flowing. The water's moving. Um, but I did not get a chance to go up and check this other one. So. Quill Run is right in between ditch five and six, st sticking with the numbers. Ditch five has been cleaned out up to Puddin Ridge Road, and it was cleaned out about 10 years ago uh, between Puddin Ridge Road and Moyot Creek, but it needs it again. Um, ditch, ditch six needs to be cleaned out, ditch four needs to be cleaned out, and then the bottleneck on ditch one is where it turns and goes underneath crossing <coughs> Sawyer Town Road in that area. But we can tell you probably where every bottleneck, I know Mike can tell you every tree across that ditch. But our problem is getting to them to well, make them big enough. Well, so if you can flood. tell us where the problems are, why don't you tell us where the problems okay. are and what you got to do to fix them? 
We can uh, do that. Uh, has the state ever responded? No, sir. As we, not. And I checked on that this afternoon. That was six listening. months ago. They have not. No, sir. That's ditch two. If you see, you can see it's a little piece of ditch two. That culvert is right there in front of the food line area that we're talking about. I rode by there this morning at 830, and it was waterfront from uh, where the Twyford's law firm office is, that one, yes, sir. all the way through past the food line, and then I looked back down the, the dirt road back there, and it was wet. I mean, everything was underwater. It was just a tremendous still, amount of water. Still that way this afternoon. Yeah, and when I came back this afternoon, it was... Still yeah. underwater. It's going out, but it just takes so long for it to get out. Do we do we have representatives in the state? I mean, how many times do we have to ask and ask for somebody to come down here with the Department of Transportation to help us with this when they're part of the problem? And they have told us that the culvert in coming off of Pudding Ridge, one of those main ditches that's going under 168 is clogged. It's not moving water. So how do we get these people out of water? And that's what I'm asking. Well, I have to ask the question, is there drainage easements past these culverts? Not sufficient, no, sir. That's our problem. So we can enlarge the culverts, but unless we get a drainage easement All to the, way, the creek. That's right. All the way to Mogout Creek. That's got to be the first thing we got to do. Yes, sir. So bring us a plan on how to address it. We've told DOT, I don't know how many times about that going on with it. We sure have, and and I don't know if you have a collective plan. Well, well, I don't think. Well, they're not moving out today, DOT. They, I saw the truck riding around. But I talked with Mr. Russell today. I had a meeting with him in the morning, the night's out, and then he he told me that they were in Moyot dealing with water water issues. They were. We saw them. We stopped and talked and. We've been dealing with them for years and haven't yes, done anything. This is a question for the county attorney. Can you condemn an easement for drainage? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, we have been successful. Unfortunately, it was not an easement granted, but a portion of the ditch in Quail Run, we, we were successful in, in having the property owners convey a license to the county to let uh, our contractor go into their property to clean a portion of that ditch. <laughs> Uh, but, but it certainly is going to take that type of cooperation from property owners if we're going to be able to alleviate or have access on a permanent nature for regular maintenance uh, to at least have an easement. That sounds like it would be the first step is to arrange access. We can't work on it if we can get access. But if DOT will not cooperate, it doesn't matter how much access you get when they control the highways. What did they say today, Eric? Did they, what did they say about it today? When I saw them, we were over on Tolls Creek Road, and we were looking at drainage in that area. So I didn't catch them at Moya or at in this area. So I don't, I don't know if they said anything or. Well, hopefully the newspapers will write a story that some people will see somewhere. We can hope. And you know, we're talking about doing studies, countywide drainage studies. We're doing our UDO rewrite and put better drainage. Uh, ordinances and manuals in it, but still, I, I think you take Mike Doxy, he can walk out here and he can show you exactly what the problem is. It don't take a study. Well, we understand with the state situation, DOT's funding, particularly with their uh, impetus to try to put as much of that burden as possible back on the localities, that they probably are not in a position to do anything with this. Can we, without significant risk to the county, uh, undertake uh, upon ourselves to do some of this work. I know there have been other localities that have gotten permission from DOT to do some maintenance of different sorts. Some kind of joint agreement with them. Take, uh, take the matter into our own hands and fix it. Yes, sir. And then, uh, Ken, if you go to drainage on. district, I don't know if you can do it without a drainage district, can you? Well, this is a drainage district. Uh, you, this part is. Does a that district. fall into in yes, the drainage district? Yes, this is the district you're looking at. Well, we can we we can do that. Then we can clean those issues out if it falls within it drains. But the water. question is, culverts underneath money, state roads. Can we go in and make those larger where we need to? Well, they made the one larger down there on the hall property. Can didn't you they? contact Jerry Jones? Yes, please. And, and, and sorry, or Anthony Roper. Certainly. 
I'm already talking to their lawyer about another matter. Yeah. Anyway, so I'll bring that up with. Just go right on, up. right on up the chain to the top. I'd be inclined to take action until I got a stop order from the state telling me I could. If this was drainage district, we can do it. We got the money. That's not how much money they have. Mike said they were getting very low. Uh, probably all. Anything else? Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Thank you, Mr. Wilder. Uh, need to come through to Mike and if you could. They sure do. Sawyer Town, they got the same problem. Next person we have signed up, Commissioner Gregory. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bob Henley called me this morning, and I better go ahead and do it before I forget it. But I promised him I would announce the Wildlife Festival that's going to be held this weekend, this Saturday and Sunday, the 12th and 13th, at the Currituck High School. Bob said they had about 50 vendors going to be there, so it ought to be a good show. Y'all try to come. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill? Uh, yes, sir. I've been contacted by several people down in Lower Curry Tuck about the timing of the stoplights. If you live on a side road, you sit there for ever and ever and ever so the tourists can get through. Now that the season's over, could we ask them to adjust the lights so that they're not uh, seven minutes going north and south and give the people on the side roads an opportunity to get out? And that would include Mayock also. I yeah. don't mind. The whole county. Yes, because it says three minutes, expect up to a three minute delay, and it's anywhere from six to eight minutes. Yes, three minutes plus interest. But if we could write a letter and ask them to please adjust the lights accordingly now that the season's over. Is that on, is that on weekends or during the week? Or? It's a whole time. I know down there in front of Sonic, you can sit there for, seems like 15 minutes seven. before the light ever changes. Well, seven minutes is a long time. Okay, so we'll that, get that taken care yes, of. Commissioner Rohr? I'd like to uh, make an announcement too. make all of you aware of the fact that the Interfaith Community Outreach Organization is having their Fall Family Festival down at the Jarvisburg Church of Christ this Saturday. It starts at 7 o'clock in the morning with a yard sale, and I think everybody should come out there because obviously you're going to need more stuff in your garage, and this is a great place to get it. But uh, starting at 11 o'clock, there will be all sorts of games going on, including a dunking booth manned by the uh, Currituck Wild Goose Rotary Club, in which a couple of commissioners are going to prominently uh, be featured, plus some of the folks from the various high schools, principals, you know, Colonel Grimes from the ROTC is going to be there. So come on out and dunk your favorite celebrities. There's going to be a great fish fry and chicken fry for lunch there. Great afternoon all the way through to 4 o'clock. And this is a great organization. You've seen presentations about them here meetings before. So I hope you'll be able to turn out and support them during that day Saturday as well. Yeah, come on out and help me take my weekly bath. Um, I'd like to just remind everybody, and then Commissioner Idlett, uh, that this Friday will be the 8th anniversary of 9-11, uh, a very historic event that happened to our country, and I'd just like for you to keep that in your thoughts and the families that were affected by 9-11 in your prayers. Uh, this country's faced a lot of adversity in the last year or so. But we need to draw on the strength and the faith that we built back 9-11-01 and bring that forward today. So I'd ask you to do that as a community as and as individuals. Mr. Ryder. I'm not sure if all of you received this or not, but <clears throat> this afternoon I received uh, a letter uh, from staff. Basically, the DOT has turned down the initiative that uh, we put together to ask about the speed limits at the schools. And, uh, they, they referenced a previous study that they had done uh, at the request of Mr. Cox uh, with the, the school board. I'm, I'm going to try to uh, reach these folks tomorrow myself and talk with them and uh, see if we can get some reasoning there. But anyhow, as it is now, they've turned it down. That's everyone we have signed up. Is anybody in the general public like to speak that did not sign up? Noting that, I'm going to close the public comment period.
Item number three, proclamation for Constitution Week. Mr. Stanley, you go. Mr. Chairman, you have in, in your, your agenda package a resolution that we received from Ms. Wade uh, on behalf of the uh, National Society of Daughters of American Revolution uh, requesting the board to step up and support, which I think this is a national effort, uh, to recognizing the week as the Constitutional uh, Constitution Week, and you have a resolution in your agenda package uh, so proclaiming. I will read the proclamation. Office of County Commissioners from Curry Tuck County, North Carolina, proclamation of Constitution Week, September the 17th through the 23rd, 2009. Whereas September the 17th, 2009, marks the 222nd anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America by the Constitutional Convention. And whereas it is fitting and proper to accord official recognition to this magnificent document and its memorable anniversary and to the patriotic celebrations which will commemorate the occasion. And whereas Public Law 915 guarantees the issuing of a proclamation each year by the President of the United States designating September the 17th through the 23rd as Constitution Week. Now therefore be it proclaimed that we, the Commissioners for Curry Tuck County, do hereby ask all citizens to affirm the ideals the framers of the Constitution had in 1787 by vigilantly protecting the freedoms guaranteed to us through this guardian of liberty, remembering that lost rights may never be regained. And therefore, uh, excuse me, in witness of whereof, I have set my hand in the seal and fixed, and fixed the great seal of the county of Curry Top. We have a motion for its adoption. So Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? May I make a comment, Mr. Yes. Here. Yes, sir. This past July 4th, I heard a presentation by one of our local citizens about the Constitution. He's a constitutional attorney who moved down here from uh, New York, lives over on Bells Island. And what he discussed was the fact that the United States was actually formed by a paper called the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation outlined in there one specific standard by which this government should operate, which is now codified in the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. And what it basically says is that all of the rights not specifically delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states. And when we go about proclaiming a week like this and acknowledging this period of time, we need to actually take note of exactly what's happening in the government, particularly at the federal level, that these rights are not being reserved to the states. The rights are being usurped as fast as they can be grabbed. And it's time we put a stop to it. And if it's going to be stopped, it's going to have to be stopped at the local level. And you just remember this the next time you go to the polls and get out and tell everybody you can to go back and read the Constitution if you haven't done it, particularly the Tenth Amendment. And let's make a noise about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anything else? Item number four, update on county ins inspection review process. Mr. Chairman, this is a, an ongoing program, a program that the county is working on. In fact, it's been assigned to uh, uh, Peter Bishop, and the board had asked for an update of where we stand on that. So with that, Pete, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and County Manager Dan Scanlon. It's a pleasure to see you all again. We uh, thank you very much earlier uh, at 5.30 for the joint work session uh, with the Economic Development Advisory Board. Certainly appreciate your time during that. Um, my name is Peter Bishop. I'm the Economic Development Director for Curry Tuck County. And then, as the County Manager Scanlon explained, uh, about May, late April, May, the uh, Board of Commissioners asked the, um, or a assigned my department to conduct an internal review of the Inspection and Permit Department. Um, it coincided very well with some of the other reviews that were going on um, in the planning department um, for our development review process and then coming up to this uh, UDO rewrite that we're going to be uh, working on here in a few months. So while uh, development, and certainly my business is development and growth, while that has been dampened somewhat in the past year or two, it's given the county a very good opportunity to reflect upon uh, how we can improve our services and all of our development review services. So that's a little bit of context uh, for where this project is coming from. Um, the goal of the review, the review process are several. 
Um, we want to take this opportunity, as I mentioned before, to look at ways that we can improve the department. Uh, wanted to engage local builders and citizens and engineers in the review process, uh, understanding specifically what their needs are uh, so that we can address those in, in making any policy changes. Um, wanted to clarify some standard, standard uh, operating procedures, um, usually standard operating procedures, the first thing you know and get so that there's a, everybody has a clear understanding of where they stand going forward through the process. And then further enhancing the communication, the education, and the online capability of the, of the department. A lot of uh, planning departments that we've seen throughout the state and the country, I'm sorry, permanent inspections departments have turned to online tools much more, are taking a more active role in education. And while our department has done some of those things and started working on them, uh, there's definitely some room for improvement that we're, we're going to look at further. Um, start with a little overview of the process here. Um, a, a lot of it starts with team building and walk t talking to staff and understanding staff perspective. Um, they are the um, they are the agents that are interacting with our clients and customers on a daily basis. Um, they're, they're the boots on the ground, so to speak. Uh, so getting a rapport with them and understanding what they're seeing on the ground every day uh, is a very important place to start, especially uh, when you're doing an internal review. Uh, secondly, a review of other governments and other pra best practices throughout the region and um, even outside of the state. We looked at 18 communities, including Chesapeake and Virginia Beach and Virginia, all the local counties here in the municipalities in Dare County and also to our west. Um, we've already had some meetings and conversations with builders, engineers, and developers, and other citizens. We're going to continue to have more of those. Where I'd say we're about halfway through the process right now, maybe a little bit more than halfway. Um, so that engagement, again, is, is, is a key. It's been an important part of what the planning department's done and some of our other departments have done. Um, it's certainly going to be the key driver to this, uh, to this process as well. Um, we're planning a survey and, and feedback uh, mechanism, and the survey is based both on what we've discovered in the meetings uh, with both our staff and with some builders and engineers, what we've seen internally as far as how uh, the permanent inspection process works, uh, and that'll give us an opportunity to get feedback, provide some answers, and some policy options to uh, the Board of Commissioners here. Um, we're going to be planning an October presentation and luncheon for late October where we'll present those results, present that feedback, present some of the things that we found through uh, what we've been looking at in these other 18 communities. And then afterwards, we, we can make policy recommendations based on what we've learned um, through those processes and then con consistently evaluating that policy as you move forward. I believe the last uh, wholesale review of the department was done in 2005. It's now 2009, four or five years later. Uh, continue to evaluate the policies and the progressions of the department so that we continue to change with the times and be adaptable. Um, another good place to start when you're working on review of departments, especially government departments, is with a mission statement and, and a statement of quality of what, what they're providing. Um, it really undergirds the entire process and, and the people that you're working with and, and the mission that they're working off. And I'll read this quickly. The inspections department promotes the efficient growth and development of Currituck's 273 square mile planning jurisdiction. Currituck is fully committed to careful growth and development. And then the last phrase is almost a personal mission statement to what every customer and client should expect when coming into our office and dealing with one of our permanent inspection officers. That they want people to feel that they have been treated courteously, promptly, fairly, professionally, and have been served by people who care. So that there's a personal commitment to the position and to each of uh, the interactions that they're having with our customers and clients. I think that's very important in, in understanding where our staff comes through in this process. Um, the operational principles are even further breaking this out, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but I wanted to illustrate them to the citizens and to the Board of the Commissioners so that you can see exactly what they're pledging to do, what each of these inspectors and our permit officers are pledging to do. Um, an, an interesting note is that each inspector is independently or individually certified, so that there's a little more at stake for an inspector who's going out to inspect your property is they have their own license on the line. So they are not only working for the county and working for their clients, but they're also working to keep themselves in compliance as well. So there's something at stake for each, um, each person in the transaction. Uh, and a quick, about, uh, a quick note here about the uh, office's responsibilities, and there, there may be some misunderstanding uh, or, or some education necessary about exactly what the Permanent Inspections Department does. Of course, they enforce the, all the applicable federal, local, and state regulations, and it's important to note the state and federal uh, uh, building codes and fire codes that this building uh, permit inspections office is forced with um, 
enforcing because these are not uh, rules or regulations that are created on a local basis. So this isn't um, a, a contractor or a resident can't just go to the county board of commissioners and say, well, I don't, I don't think I should have that firewall there. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. There's a federal set of... Uh, set of guidelines that's in place that each of these builders must meet. It's in the building code. We're here to enforce that code. Um, conducting plan review, processing permit applications, and of course conducting inspections, uh, some of the basic everyday activities of the office. Um, something that perhaps, again, the citizens and the Board of Commissioners may not know is all the pr public support that the office provides through education, uh, through online, and through code interpretations that they do. Um, and then finally, Currituck County's uh, Planning and Inspections Department is actually an independent department, only one of three in the 18 counties that we looked at uh, as an independent department. Most are coupled with planning or some other development services arm. Um, we have seven employees, a budget of just over half a million, and we have two offices here in the mainland at this office in, in Corolla. There's uh, an inspector um, and also a permit officer out there as well. Um, so I talked a little bit about the regional permanent inspection offices and how exactly does Currituck stack up or compare? Well, first of all, our budget is slightly larger and we have slightly more staff. And I think that's mostly attributable to two things. One, the great uh, expanse of land that we have to travel and some of our unique geography. And number two, that we have no incorporated places. A lot of the other communities that we studied had cities as well as counties. They overlap some of those duties. In Dare County, there are very few, very few unincorporated areas. So the cities, actually, the little communities, the towns have a lot more staff than, say, the county would in, in this case. Um, our fee structure is similar to the rural Northeast North Carolina communities, such as Perquimans, Camden, Pasquotank, but we are much lower than the incorporated areas of Dare County and much lower than Virginia Beach and the city of Chesapeake. So on a per square foot basis, you're being charged significantly less in Currituck County vis-a-vis -vis Southern Shores, the town of Duck, Nags Head, Chesapeake, or Virginia Beach. So to be sure, building is certainly cheaper from a permit standpoint in Currituck County than it is in some of those more populous communities. Um, again, I mentioned about us being uh, an independent department. While that's somewhat unique, it's not unheard of in the area. And then uh, our website and available Peter, information online. Peter, yes, sir. Explain what you mean by one of only three independent departments. Why, why are we one of three when there's 18 that aren't? Why, what's the... There, there's 18 total <laughs> communities that we compared. Of those 18, four of them are not as part of the planning department. Typically, or not, I wouldn't say typically, but historically, planning and inspections have been together in one department. And other places, they are part of a development services team, which in some cases can actually be under an economic development or engineering arm of a government. And then the third place is to be independent and of themselves. What are the three? The other three? Oh, boy, I don't know offhand. I can't, I can't think. You caught me. I can't think of which of the other three are. There's some that actually function as part of the economic development? One, under the economic to, development and community development. As department. opposed to sort of a development prevention department? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> did, I, did I answer your question? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a copy of this on my agenda for some reason. I don't but uh, there's some points in there that I'm going to want to talk to you about after you finish. Certainly. A couple preliminary findings at this point in what's been going on. Um, first of all, I want to recognize some of the staff efforts to improve development services, not only the planning department, but also the permanent inspections department. There's been some internal review done by uh, Spence Costello right there, uh, the chief building inspector, and also the development of the Handy Homer Interactive uh, Citizen Tool that helps guide you and walk you through the process. Um, there's a blog that one of our inspectors, Bill Noons, has constructed that he can communicate with builders and citizens with to talk about code issues. Uh, those are some really great uh, advances that none of the other, none of our other competitors or comparables are doing. So it's a, a great step in the right direction for the department. And I wanted to start out by recognizing that. Um, I think we've seen that reestablishing and nurturing relationships with private associations, builders associations, and citizens is really going to be the the linchpin to this review process is them getting to know us again and us getting to know them again. We, we had a really strong and fast and furious period of development in the from early 2000s up until about the mid 2000s and it came to a point where 
they were so busy downstairs that some of the service aspects may have lacked a little bit and some of the client um, client comments were, were beginning to reflect that. Well, since we've slowed down some, we've lost some of those relationships with the associations that we work closely with on the private side. We want to rebuild those relationships and improve them and thus improve the image overall of the county and its development services arm so that we're, we're, we're considered a partner in the process, not uh, a hindrance in the process as some permanent inspections departments are throughout the area. Um, it's really also a good opportunity, I think, for pre-construction review and additional meetings with our project, uh, project clients and with county staff. There's still better coordination that can be done within the courthouse to get the results that we need to our clients faster and on a more consistent basis. And that's something that preliminary we've, we've seen and I think we can flesh out a little better. Um, there's always the opportunity to enhance our educational online and interactive capabilities. Um, a lot of things are moving online. now. We're, we're not, uh, you know, the bus-selling metropolis, so I'm not talking about getting the Cadillac online version of uh, permit and inspection process, but things to consider could be fast-tracking permits for certain situations or for, uh, well, economic development projects. I'd, I'd certainly like to see something like that. Uh, an another thing that we can look at is doing more online payments so that people don't have to drive 40, 30 minutes to come in and pay a permit fee, maybe even pick up their permits online or issue them online. So there are some things electronically we can do. And on the education side, building off of the handy Homer success and off of the uh, blog success, um, actually Bill Nunes is doing a class, uh, one of our inspectors, on the 17th of September uh, at the Cooperative Extension Building to talk about some residential code issues, building that as a more regular piece of the department so that we are interacting more with those folks that we are getting out and that we're providing a service uh, along with the customer service that they would come to expect. Um, and then finally, creative and constructive policy to continue to help improving um, with future growth and demand because we may be slow right now and, and you know, knock on wood, we're going to get faster and we're going to get more development going on. So again, we have some opportunities to do some good things now so that we're ready and prepared for the influx when it comes in the future. Uh, a little bit about the future steps and engagement. Uh, again, I talked a lot about the associations to work with. Um, I'm going to continue to work with the Outer Banks Home Builders Association and the Albemarle Home Builders Association. I've spoken to both of the local representatives for those agencies. We'll be meeting tomorrow uh, with the county manager and the planning director with the Outer Banks Home Builders Association. I look forward to having a full presentation to their entire board as well as the Albemarle. Uh, home Builders Associations, again, trying to rebuild those relationships. Um, the survey that I mentioned before is, a, is one of our future steps, uh, the presentation and the policy recommendations. And then, again, always reviewing and looking at what we're suggesting, what it's going to mean for the county and for our builders, and how it's going to uh, improve the county in the future. Yeah. And I guess that's all I have. Mr. O'Neill, any questions? What's the turnaround time for a permit now? <clears throat> We say, I believe, anywhere from two to three days to a week, and that is something that we also discovered in this process, and, and I don't know, Ben, if you can answer that question better than me, but it's uh, a management of expectations was a suggestion from a previous review, and there's, there, there's certainly a friction between, well, do you manage an expectation and give a window of time, or do you give a definite, concrete, you know, three days you'll have your permit, and if something goes wrong, well, then it's, you know, your own word for saying you get it done in three days. Why would it take a week? There's nothing being built in Curry Tuck County. If somebody needs a permit, they should get it th that afternoon or the next morning. Why would it take a week? I had a gentleman call me last week that said our computer system was down. When he called to check on his permit, they couldn't issue it because the computer system was down. Well, that was from our lightning strikes, yes. We well, cannot write a handwritten permit? Our system, system go ahead. When, when, you, when you called and... That gentleman's permit had already been issued. For so I, I have no idea why he called you. He already had his permit that day. He had it that day. Before, before, he, he, call, would, before he called you, he already had his exactly. permit. Exactly. But he was sharing with me before that he couldn't get his permit mm -hmm. because the computer system went down for two days. Mm -hmm. My point is, is there's nothing going on. If somebody needs a permit, they should be able to get it at the end of the day or the next morning. It shouldn't take a week to get a building permit. If, if they bring in a complete application, it is turned around in the shorter time frame in, in two days um, because it's not just us that has to review it. The uh, health department has to review it. Zoning has to review it. The building inspector. There's several different agencies that are involved. Generally, if it takes a week, it is because the initial application was either not complete, uh, there's information missing, or somebody in this string of reviews had questions 
uh, that are pending that are still waiting to be answered. Okay, and I'm not I'm not beating up the inspections department. I'm just saying mm-hmm. I get phone calls just like the rest of these guys who aren't saying anything. They get phone calls too, <laughs> and people asking why am I getting an inspection today? I do what it says, and then the next come next day, and they add more stuff for me. I got to do things like that. Everybody gets those phone calls. I'm telling you about. Can I beat them? Uh, can I beat them up a minute? No, let's be nice tonight, but you can okay. share your... I'm just experience. wondering, I'm not really just, you know, <laughs> playing with you, Peter. Because previous meeting, we had such a good time. Uh, comparatively speaking, in the period from 04 to 06, yes. versus the period from 08 to 09, what's the relative volume of permits being issued? Uh, the, the vol- I don't know the, the volume in permits issued, but I know the value volume. And we were approaching a million dollars, I think, in 2004 was our, our high point, and we're down to collected up to year-to-date today, I think $170,000 in permit fees in a year-to-date 2009 versus, I think, 948000 in 2002, or 2004, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not the greatest economic prognosticator in the world, but I do read the paper. I think it was Will Rogers at one time that if you... Uh, uh, read the newspapers. No, I said, if you don't read the newspapers, you'll be uninformed. If you read the newspapers, you'll be misinformed. <laughs> we'll take that with a grain of salt. But I don't see things improving quickly. And my point was, we still got the same department and budget, you know, half a million dollars and seven people that was processing a million dollars worth of permits and fees, and we're down to a hundred. And, you know, anybody think that's going to turn around in the next year or so? Or are we just going to add infinitum, maintain our ability to? React instantaneously. Well, I, I think let, you let, let me answer that. We do not have the same staff today that we had during the peak of the building permits. The positions are there, but they're unfilled. We have a building inspector on the Outer Banks position that's vacant that we had intentionally kept vacant uh, because of the drop in permits. Uh, we also have a permit officer position that is currently vacant, uh, again, waiting for the turnaround. So, as far as staffing, we are not staffed similar today as we were, say, uh, three years ago. Uh, as far as your question about building permits, uh, the, although obviously there has been a significant decrease in new construction permits, uh, generally the trend that you see, which we certainly have seen, is when the economy turns down, folks are not building new, they are renovating, repairing, and, and uh, alternating uh, their houses. So if you look at the amount of inspections uh, that is being conducted in the department, although it is, it is not as high as it was in the peak of, of the boom, uh, it is certainly nowhere near I think what the general perception is uh, that the, you know, the work has dropped off. There's a lot of inspections that goes on because folks are generally at this time uh, in this kind of economy are doing alterations, repairs, and modification versus new construction. So uh, all these numbers are available. I don't have them tonight, but we certainly can share with you over the last 10, 15 years what the building permit activity has been and the types of permits that have been issued. Uh, because, again, in, in a down economy, you see them shift from uh, new construction you generally see them as, as a modifier. You see them shift over to uh, repairs, renovation, alteration. So, uh, but the amount of inspections they're doing, again, although down, is is not near. Um, I think as low as most people's perception might be, or, or the, the the appearance would be. But the value, again, the value of those permits is much less as their alterations. So that obviously they're they're going to bring in less funding and revenue for the county. Any other questions for Mr. Bishop? Get us a copy of the presentation. Get us yes, a copy of the presentation, those uh, figures that you were just talking about. Yes, sir. Mr. I like, I like, well, I, there was one or two suggestions uh, from two individuals I've talked to in the last month, and one of those is that uh, a business owner wanted to simply move a sign, and they said that, that it was next to impossible for them to get the information on the county website to do that. And it looks like to me that, and I think it was one of your suggestions, mm-hmm. Peter, that, that you try to take some of the simple things and some of the simple renovations where somebody could sit at home and fill out a PDF and, and, and give you everything, pay for mm-hmm. it online, and not have to you know come down here and go back. But uh, I, I agree that we need to try to cut this time down. As a, a week is, uh, you know, for, for something simple is a long period of time to, to go ahead and get a permit. But, and I don't know what the problems they had with the website were, but they said it was next to impossible to even find out what the regulations were as far as moving a sign in a business. Mm-hmm. 
Well, and then another presentation for another day, but we are working on website adjustments as well and, and making that more intuitive for our, uh, for our citizens and our clients. But um, you, I agree 100%. I think the, the department and staff agrees that there's a lot more things we can do with the online resource, just even simply putting PDFs available for download, um, which is a very simple thing to do. We can, we can definitely improve the distribution of information. Thank you, Peter. I have one more question. We, we discussed some time ago about a function similar to an ombudsman in the permits department, wherein somebody coming in who is not familiar with the process could be taken by the hand and walk through the process. Uh, other than Handy Homer, have we made any progress along that line? Well, we, we do not have a specific staff person assigned to that duty. Uh, however, I'd argue that between myself and our existing permit officers and inspection staff, that we do a pretty good job of handling clients as they come in and discussing them, especially on a preliminary basis, and setting them up, whether it's myself or James Mims, the fire inspector, or Ben Woody, the planning director. We will typically get together with a prospective business owner and talk to them about some of the issues and, and let them know, give them the heads up, oh, you, you might want to look into this building, or if you're changing uses, let's look at the thickness of that wall prior to them coming to a permit application so that we don't have a weak delay or a problem on the back side, so that everything's there on the front side. So they should call you? What you they, should, they should call you if they have no Yes, problem. please. Okay. Please do. Hope everybody heard that. Thank you now, Mr. Bishop. Appreciate it. Item number five, public hearing in action on the creation of the Corova Beach Road Service District. Mr. McCree. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, this matter is on for public hearing tonight on the question of whether to create a service district to be known as the Corova Beach Road Service District uh, created pursuant to the authority granted to the county by 153A301 of the general statutes, which allows for coastal area counties uh, to create uh, road service districts for the purpose of maintaining roads, uh, the General Assembly having recognized that coastal area counties have a unique circumstance, particularly with regard to travel ways and roads that are typically uh, ungraded sand travel ways uh, and that lack maintenance uh, from the date that they were originally created. Uh, as proposed, uh, this uh, service district will uh, consist of the rights of way, all the rights of way, of platted streets within Corova Beach subdivision as appears from plats of record recorded in the late 1960s and found in the uh, Register of Deeds office uh, here in Currituck. Uh, there has also uh, been uh, provided with the report uh, filed four weeks ago as provided by statute on the creation of this district a map of the proposed district as well. Uh, th there will also be uh, the creation uh, of an advisory board uh, if you adopt the resolution following the public hearing tonight uh, that will be comprised of seven members and it would be proposed that three of the advisory board members would be full-time residents of Corova Beach. One would be an absentee Corova Beach subdivision property owner, one representing the fire department, one representing the emergency medical services, and one representing the sheriff. As set forth in the proposed resolution, uh, th that advisory board would be tasked with uh, various duties including the assessment of road conditions, in Corova Beach, the development of a prioritized list of roads that, uh, and rights of way that would need maintenance, uh, and they would prepare and submit regular reports to this board uh, for you as a governing board of the district to act upon, uh, in particular with regard to the establishment of contracts through private entities uh, for uh, the maintenance of, of streets or, or areas that the advisory board might present to you as priority needs. Uh, with regard to the funding, uh, there will be no tax uh, imposed in this uh, service district for, among other reasons, there is no property to be taxed within the service district. The rights of way uh, within Corova Beach subdivision do not have an assessed value, and thus there, there could be no tax imposed uh, upon the rights of way. They haven't been dedicated uh, to the public for public use on the plats that went to record in the late 1960s. It is expected and anticipated that the the uh, revenue that will be utilized uh, to fund the, the street maintenance program uh, within the service district will be, come from occupancy tax. Uh, again, to the extent that this board, as a governing board of the district, would make a determination each year uh, with regard to the amount of monies to be funded uh, and contracts to be issued 
uh, for a work program for any given year. Uh, with that, I'll answer any questions the board might have before you open the public hearing. You've heard uh, the county attorney's presentation. Is there any questions or comments for the public hearing? I'd like for the county attorney to expand, uh, if you can, on the public right of way that could uh, could change in time. In other words, if these roads became paved roads uh, and were connected, how would this affect the future use of these roads as a public right of way? maintained by the state. Well, of course, the, the, these roads would not be, uh, I guess you're talking about if a subdivision were ever created yeah. here such that they might be improved to a state standard such that the state yes, might sir. take them over. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th that might then uh, raise the question as to whether the Board of Commissioners uh, would want to modify uh, the boundaries of the district to remove those particular rights of way since they would be taken over for state maintenance. Now, whether that might ever happen, or is conceivable, perhaps it would, but uh, given the current state of affairs, I don't know that the state would ever find itself in a position to take over the maintenance of responsibility for the roads in their, in their current status or current location in particular. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing. I'm going to ask that when you come forward, I'm going to call the names of the individuals that we sign, have signed up. And then after those individuals speak, anybody else that would like to address, and I'm going to ask that you come forward. The county attorney is going to be the timekeeper, three minutes to each individual. State your name, address for the record, and whether you live in Corova Beach or not. Thank you. I'm going to open the public hearing. The first person we have signed up is Deborah Anucci. Did I say that correctly? Um. Thank you. But don't be. <laughs> Thanks for getting that right and not butchering it. I am Deborah Iannucci. My address is actually uh, 1305 Willowwood Lane in Virginia Beach, although I am a property owner in Swan Beach at 1685 Sandpiper Road. I'm here and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of the Swan Beach Property Owners Association. First thing, I would like to thank District 1 Commissioner Vance Eilert, Commissioners Etheridge and O'Neill, and County Attorney Ike McCree, as well as County Manager Dan Scanlon and the County Planning Director Ben Woody for that time that they spent several months ago with the residents in the off-road area explaining the nature and purpose of a service district for road maintenance. We very much appreciate the open dialogue that the commissioners have had with our community to help us to understand the issues, similarities, and differences in our off-road community. Secondly, we the citizens of Swan Beach and the property owners of Swan Beach are grateful that in bringing this Corova Service District forward, the commissioners listened to the residents of Swan Beach when they overwhelmingly voted against a service district in our area. On behalf of the Swan Beach Properties Owners Association, I am here to reinforce our strong opposition to a service district in Swan Beach. We do not demand any of the services for road improvement or maintenance that are noted in the report for Corova. Our community has established an independent committee and has seed funded the work of the committee to address priority issues as identified by our community. We do not have any major pot rolls potholes rather in our neighborhood. In fact, the only concern our community has in relation to road maintenance is the opposite, the buildup of sand on the oceanfront roads. We find our roads passable and their design does not encourage excessive speed. Again, we appreciate the acknowledgement that there is no demand or need for a service district in Swan Beach. However, we do have a major concern that we hope will be addressed if this <coughs> service district does go forward. In fact, we hope our concerns would be addressed even if the service district does not go forward. There is an incredible increase in the traffic in our community this past summer. This traffic is not from rentals in our neighborhoods or from more residents. A normal summer day might see in the neighborhood of 50 cars of rev residents or rental guests moving along our streets. However, this summer that number, number mushroomed into daily safari park of an estimated 300 to 400 cars. From tour vehicles to wanderers seeking to tear up some dune, 
or explore the back roads. This new traffic is not respectful of our area and will contribute to the deterioration of the roads if left unabated. Imagine all these vehicles every day going by your house, not being able to drive down your street without cars blocking your passage as visitors walk around in your yard or your neighbor's yard. Imagine cars pulling into your driveway, disrespecting your property, and people using your private property as a public restroom. While we realize that this service district is not our specific neighborhood, we do also realize that any activity in the off-road area impacts the entire off-road area. We are concerned that by establishing a service district in Corova for road improvement and without coupling this with some type of a program to end the disrespectful and destructive behavior and sheer volume of cars that joy ride through our streets, that this could lead to more traffic as the roads are perceived to be better. And, and therefore and thereby more destruction potentially. We are concerned that the roads will be damaged and that our ability to continue to maintain them will require that in the future we may have to request tax dollars that we believe could be used more importantly for other county projects whether on the mainland or elsewhere in our community such as protection of the wild horses or uh, protecting our county's pristine beach. That's time Mr. Chair. Can you finish up? How, how much more do you have? Yes. This much. Are you uh, Robert I. Nucci? Yes, sir. Okay. We reiterate that our complete desire is not to have a service district established or expanded into Swan Beach. We ex respect the opinions of the Corova community in handling their unique road issues. Together, all of our communities in the off-road area have the desire to protect and retain its natural beauty. That is the main reason why many of us live there or own property there or visit there. Thank you so much for listening, your continued support, and for helping us to protect this unique resource of our county. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Since Mr. Iannucci ceded his time, next person is Lynn Wilson. Good evening. I'm Lynn Wilson. I live in North Swan Beach. Several months ago, the off-road communities were, for perhaps the first time, presented with a clear and comprehensive explanation of the historically explosive words, service district. I would like to take this opportunity to express appreciation to our District 1 Commissioner, Vance Idlett, Commissioner Etheridge and O'Neill, County Manager Dan Scanlon, County Attorney Ike McCree, and County Planning Director Ben Woody, for making this happen. Perhaps most enlightening and reasonable was the recognition of each off-road community as a separate neighborhood, each having its own voice. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to have our voice be heard as it has been heard in making our decision on this issue. Speaking for the community of North Swan Beach, of which I am a resident and, president and currently interim president of the North Swan Beach Property Owner Association as the group reorganizes, I feel it is appropriate to reiterate at this time that the majority of residents of North Swan Beach neither feel the need nor support their creation of a service district in our community. We are a small community, our roads are few, and for the most part in good condition. The residents of North Swan Beach wish to retain the character and environmental integrity of our sand road communities. We want to protect the local wildlife and wild horse population. All of these things are potentially threatened by creation of a service district that might allow widening and grading roads to a level that, one, could encourage speeding, already a notable problem, two, could result in an increase in already excessive and invasive traffic. Uh, the numbers uh, attested by our Swan Beach neighbors just a moment ago. Nor do we support the creation of a service district that would, that would encourage the acceleration of development. I think we all agree that the recovery of the real estate market and construction reflects to a degree an improvement in our economy. However, before encouraging um, excuse me, however, before encouraging and accelerating the return of quote business as usual, there is clearly a need for rethinking construction practices and trends, taking into consideration our precious natural resources in the area, especially at a time when Perth County is in early stages of going green. 
Those residents of Corova Beach who support the creation of a service district in Corova Beach evidently endorse it as the best given choice for dealing with serious road conditions needing repair. Clearly, this proposal to use the occupancy taxes made available from the tourist population, which has contributed greatly to the ongoing intense use and consequential wear of these roads, is appropriate. Although it is stated in the resolution that the county, quote, may allocate to the Corova Beach Road <coughs> Service District any revenue whose use is not restricted by law, end of quote. This seems discrepant and gives reason for concern. Thank you for listening, and thank you again for recognizing that although all off-road communities share the desire to retain the unique and relatively unspoiled and environmentally sound character of the area, to keep our community safe for both human and animal population, we have differing opinions on strategies towards reaching this goal. Thank you. Charlie Poole. Mr. Chairman, Mr. and Ms. Uh, Commissioners, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, I am Charlie Poole, a resident of Corova Beach, and have been so for 23 years. I have repeatedly been before the Board of Commissioners over the years uh, representing the community and voicing the community's objections to a service district. <coughs> for road improvements. Coming straight to the point, in previous proposed service districts, the community was left out of any decision making of the proposed road repairs. After two town meetings, numerous phone calls and emails, um, the large majority of the community now supports the present proposed service district. The community has asked me to thank you, our commissioner, Vance Adley, uh, all the other commissioners, and the county staff for including the community in the workable approach to resolving the road issues in Corova Beach. I have a petition that's signed by 51 people that I've given to the clerk um, for your review. And uh, the petition is uh, for people that favor the approval of the service district. Including the majority of the problems, oh, I'm sorry, including the majority of the residents and property owners would like to ask you for your support in approving the proposed service district. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next person, Bill Van. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Bill Van. I'm the fire chief at Corova Beach, which, as you know, covers all these areas that we talked about, uh, that the other speakers have spoken about. But I'm looking more at Corova. I was asked to talk about the impact of our roads on emergency services in the area. Uh, yes, we are getting to the point that the conditions of the roads and the loss of the right-of-way because of the growth, the trees, the, the underbrush that's taken over the roads, it is getting more and more difficult to respond to emergency situations in the area. To the point now, if an ambulance comes down the beach into the Corova area, it is part of our routine to have a member of the fire department meet them on the beach, escort them around the holes, through the cut-arounds, which you're probably all familiar with, over private property sometime and around the holes that some get to three and four foot deep to get them into where the situation is and then to take them back out to the beach. So yes, there is an impact to emergency services from our condition in Corova Beach. And I, like uh, Mr. Poole earlier said, I was dead set against it for years because the package that we were presented up till now uh, was threatening to the neighbors in the Corova Beach area. Uh, what 
you folks have done now, the package is being presented. To me, I, I think we have, it is the right thing to do as I see it personally. Uh, and it will do nothing but enhance uh, our, our ability to respond to emergencies. So we need to have the service district. We need to improve our roads. The fire department has, as I'm sure you're aware, on several occasions raised funds, done road repairs, contracted out road repairs in the Grove area. We had Ocean Pearl graded for a, about two and a half miles one year just so we could move up and down that that strip of, of roadway. With the traffic that was mentioned earlier, the tours, walked out the station door one day and counted 12 to 13 cars sitting around our training field looking at the horses. Most of those were rental vehicles. Traffic has just gone out the roof this summer. So our roads can't take it if we don't do more than the little effort that the fire department's been put in it, putting into it to keep them going. So, with the passing of this uh, service district, I would hope that our roads will start back on an improving cycle. We don't expect them to be repaired tomorrow. I hope we never see the hard surface that, that was mentioned earlier. We, we don't want that in Corova, Swan Beach or not Swan Beach. We want to maintain the environment we have down there, but on the other hand, we want our community to be a safe one. And I think if we if we do what's being proposed now, uh, that will be a move in the, in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van. That's everyone we have signed up to speak. Is there anybody that would like to speak to this? Yes, sir. State your name. William Thrasher, Corova Beach, Corova Road. Um, I'm, I'm leaning more towards the um, service district, but I don't hear as much talk as I think you should have um, being from a farming background um, drainage issues just like in a new neighborhood our drainage culverts and ditches have been there since the late 60s and they've never had anything done to it with the exception of a few of us who get together by the pipe ourselves and have the culverts cleaned out to keep our houses from flooding what bothers me is if they start repairing these deep holes without spending money on your drainage first who is that going to flood out and what what problems are you going to have when you correct something and uh put water onto somebody's land where it had never been going before what problems is that going to have and um, that's just what worries me i think a lot of attention ought to be put into this drainage because that's the basis of it all you can fix holes but the water's going to go somewhere else and make a hole and when you get your four-wheel drive clubs in, they love holes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thrasher. Anybody else? Any commissioners like to speak for close public hearing? I'd just like to add an ex excerpt from the letter that the sheriff has written us talking about public safety. I'll just read this one paragraph. It has become increasingly difficult to determine safe passage in and around the area of Corova Beach and call response is contingent upon weather conditions. There are times we forego the traditional vehicle response and utilize the all-terrain vehicles because standing water conditions are too dangerous to traverse. We have already experienced the loss of vehicles swamped by water and the cost of replacing those vehicles. Quick response is essential to law enforcement, rescue and fire vehicles, and positive results are contingent upon an immediate response. Lack of signage and road conditions results in extended response times, creating a negative impression from recipients of service. A better solution must be found for the residents and visitors who are entitled to the professional and progressive services of all the facets of public safety. And then we have one from Director of uh, Medical Services, Michael Carter. Uh, currently, this I'll just read another excerpt. Currently, the service district can be difficult to maneuver equipment and provide quick and efficient care due to the fact that address signs are not clearly marked and the roads are not visible to the public. This can cause safety issues and increase response times to those who are already in a remote part of the county. 
I believe that providing a more progressive district service within the Corova Beach area will allow for a safer and more efficient emergency response environment. And I just, for me, it's a safety issue as much as it is anything. I've been up there and met with some of the good folks in Corova and to get to the fire department, I was afraid to even go in one of those puddles. I was up a vehicle about to roll over to keep from going through one of those those puddles. They were so bad. So to me it's a it's a safety issue and a health and safety issue. We invite thousands of people to come visit in Curry Tuck. We all know the stories of people that got stranded in their houses, the people that are losing their vehicles, that you know, they rent a four wheel drive, they go to Coro Corova first time they see the water they don't know that it's six foot deep or four foot deep they take their vehicle to go through it thinking it's just a little bit of water ruin their vacations creates uh, hazardous conditions and, and I just am approaching it from a public safety issue and uh, realizing that it's not popular with everyone but I will have to say I've been in public hearings on this issue twice before when the courthouse was packed hanging out the doors and the windows and every person was in opposition. So I think that Commissioner Idlett and the staff has done a great job of explaining <coughs> the program and uh, the benefits and with the appointing of the Citizen Advisory Committee, uh, I think it's the right thing to do. Chairman. Thank you. Chairman. Yes, sir. There's been a lot of dialogue about this and I want to thank everyone that turned out tonight from Corova, Swan, North Swan, for coming in and uh, sharing your voice. Everybody's voice is important to me, and I think I tried to show that in the meetings that we had. Uh, uh, I have talked to numerous people in Corova. I've, I've tried to do my research before I ever brought this about. This is not something that Vance brought up. This is something that constituents in the area brought to me and asked me to pursue. Uh, was there any way to do some road improvements in that area? And and uh, I, I tried, we talked about it in a retreat, about different mechanisms, and it all kept boiling back down to we have a mechanism in place. So then it, to me it was apparent that uh, what I needed to do is try to inform and educate everyone to the best of my ability. And, and Mr. McCree has been wonderful, uh, but all of you have uh, certainly deserved a big thanks for being a part of it. Uh, so, I, like I said, I've talked to numerous people. I, I suspect 75% of the people I have talked to that are property owners or residents in Corova are in favor of this thing. So, uh, uh, but again, I thank, thank you to all of you for your time and input and efforts to help me get this done. Anything else? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to commend um, Mr. Idlett for the job that he's done uh, from day one when I was involved in this. I totally supported the service district from the uh, standpoint that Commissioner O'Neill outlined uh, simply because the roads uh, were impassable, uh, particularly for uh, EMT people, number one, and, and fire people, number two. Uh, and we reached an impasse because of the reasons we reached impasses, but I've always supported this, and I applaud him for, for getting the people together, and we separated the districts that did not want to be part of it, which I think was a crucial part of this, and he was able to negotiate uh, with Mr. Poole and with the fire department. And uh, I have personally talked to a dozen people in Corova Beach who have reiterated uh, what the people here said, that they evidently the total community is in favor of this, and I think it goes without saying that this, as Mr. O'Neill said, is totally different from the other public hearings we've had on this because we actually had no one speak against it. And again, that's commendable to the job that Mr. Idler did. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll just reiterate what Mr. Nelms just said and what Commissioner O'Neill said. First thing a county commissioner we're charged with is to do no harm. And that's what we feel like this plan will provide for Corova Beach. It will do no harm. It will only enhance the ability to provide emergency medical services and law enforcement. So it's not going to be perfect. We're going to have opportunities to go back in and look at where maybe we made mistakes. But the main thing is that I feel like there's a sense of cooperation 
between the people in Corova Beach and this board on how we're going to handle it. So anything else? Noting none, I'm going to close the public hearing. What's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a motion that we approve as written. Second. We have a motion and a second from Commissioner O'Neill. Commissioner Idlett made the first. Is there any more discussion on it? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you all for coming out. Item number six, public hearing in action. PB08-45, Estates at Corova Beach. Request for a preliminary plat, special use permit approval of an open space subdivision to replat 20 existing lots into 28 residential lots in Corova Beach subdivision, section 1235 and 9, Fruitful Township. Mr. Woody? This is a special use permit, so anybody that needs to speak is a representative here from Corova Beach. States. Need to swear you in. I stand on by, raise your right hand. Do you swear the information you can provide in this matter tonight is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Mr. Woody? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. And just to clarify, that this subdivision request has nothing to do with the uh, service district proposal we just uh, heard and went through. This is an entirely separate uh, matter of business. And this is um, the preliminary plat approval. This particular request uh, required a text amendment initially to make some of the open space uh, arrangements work. And additionally, it's been before this board before for a special use permit and sketch plan approval when our process was a little different. So this is the second time we've uh, seen this particular subdivision. So there should be some familiarity with it. Uh, this is what we're going to, what's called section one. I'm going to go through kind of the, where the pieces of the subdivision are. Um, each of these sections that originally in the 60s were platted as business plots, but obviously once the, uh, once the federal government designated this area as a COBRA zone and and funds are not available for infrastructure improvements, you've kind of had the resulting situation, which is sand roads. Um, the owner, the development corporation of these business plots, is now proposing to move forward with uh, a residential subdivision for each, each area. Um, and what you originally had is, is a total of 20 parcels um, that were originally platted for business again, and, and now we're going to result with 28 residential lots, most of which are clustered to the ocean front with the open space back towards the sound. This is section one. You can see eight lots there. This is adjacent to the state line. That's False Cape State Park to the north. This is section two. Uh, it's about midway through Corova. Um, it's four lots. And you see a stretch again from ocean front to sound. And this is section five. This is kind of the southern end of, of Corova. Um, this is where you see uh, the fire stations located in this, in this part of Corova. And these are eight lots also, which are being replatted into a residential subdivision. And I want to go through real quickly. Again, you saw what the layout looks like presently. I want to go through what the uh, preliminary plat, what's before you tonight, what the changes look like. Um, this is section one. It's a total of 31.3 acres. And, um, and real, actually, let me say one thing real quickly. The minimum lot size in Corova is 2.75 acres. So if you create a lot in Corova, it's got to be 2.75 acres. Our ordinance allows you to cluster that down to 1.5 acres. So you can get down to 1.5 acres. One thing to keep in mind is the difference between 1.5 acres and 2.75 acres must go into open space. So these are called open space subdivisions. So even though it feels like the lots are getting smaller, the density is not really increasing. The density is based on a, th a three acre lot. It's just a matter of clustering lots and creating open space, which is a preferred subdivision design from an environmental perspective. So this is section one. You can see there you've got 11 lots here. And then to the rear, you can see the large contiguous areas of open space that will be created through this. This is section two. This is where we had four lots. Originally, again, you can see there's eight lots that are created and, and they've clustered their lots towards the ocean front where the value is for the developer. And then towards the rear of the property, you can see where there's been open space that's created. Um, this particular site is 22 acres, with eight acres of it becoming open space. And then the last section I'll go through is uh, section five. This is the section where you end up having uh, nine lots, 
total acreage here is, is 20.5 acres and, and the open space created is 7.3 acres. And in this particular tract you can see the open space kind of surrounds the existing Corova Beach Fire Station and also there's some open space created on the uh, canal front there. Um, and I can go back through these maps that the board needs me to. And in your packet tonight, you've got the uh, staff recommendation and, and the recommended findings of fact. This is a special use permit. Um, the planning board heard this request at their, at their meeting last month. The planning board recommended unanimous approval. Um, the staff is also recommending approval um, with the conditions and recommendations in, in the case analysis. There is one condition I want to point out to the board. It doesn't require action tonight, but it's something that's in the special use permit that I think warrants mentioning. Um, there, there are other conditions, but I won't go through all those. Uh, one thing we've talked about is the idea of open space being created and what you end up with is about um, 27 acres of open space total that becomes available through this subdivision request. And one option the Board of Commissioners has in the open space is you can accept that open space and it then becomes county property or, or an acquisition or county assets up there. Um, what staff did is we put a condition in the use permit that says um, that the county can accept the open space and if we do it would be accepted in, under a general warranty deed that means it would become our property um, that would occur after the Board of Commissioners adopts a resolution formally accepting the open space and the reason I don't have the resolution for you tonight is the next step in the subdivision process is the submission of construction plans the detailed engineering work and staff thinks that before we accept the open space formally we should see how all the engineering kind of works out and make sure we know what we're getting um, so what we would recommend, uh, the condition for the use permit is that if the preliminary plat's approved tonight, we'll wait for the construction drawings to be submitted. County engineer Mike Doxey reviews those, come back to the board and kind of say, well, here's what the open space, here's how it lays out. Um, if the board wants the open space, they can accept it via resolution. If that's done, then the applicant will bring forward a final plat. When the final plat's recorded, we will then receive the deed for the property. Um, that is one condition I just wanted to bring to the attention to the board. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any other questions you have. Any questions from Mr. Woody on this proposal? Hearing none, I'm going to uh, open the public hearing. We have no one signed up to speak. Does anybody like to speak? Bissell, if you'll state your name and address for the record. Mark Bissell, the Bissell Professional Group for Kitty Hawk, and we're representing the developer, Ocean Corova. And I just want to say that um, we've been through a, a long and detailed process over the last couple of years and we've met with uh, a lot of people and had discussions with a lot of people and all who, who have cooperated to get us where we are today, including the county staff, a number of the residents of, of Corova Beach. Um, uh, we've met with camera representatives on site a couple of times, uh, the health department, uh, some planning board members and others. Uh, and I think uh, as a result of all that uh, time and energy and, and uh, effort, um, we have a project that um, uh, really meets the needs of the area uh, and the developer. Uh, this board has cooperated uh, and we appreciate that in the um, Adoption of some text amendments that has allowed the, the style of development that we think is most appropriate for the area to proceed uh, and also to uh, adopt a resolution that has allowed the rearrangement of some existing beach accesses to conform to historic uses as well as uh, allowing some unimproved accesses to then be opened up for uh, pedestrian use for in the interest of public safety. So. Overall, I think we've got a, a great plan, um, and uh, we have basically have just provided more detail of the plan that you all have uh, approved and issued the special use permit for under the under the old rules with the with the sketch plan that was submitted uh, some months ago. And I would just uh, ask you to uh, reconsider approval of this. And uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Is the dilapidated house next to the fire department going to be torn down? Uh, it's my understanding that the uh, a number of people have agreed to cooperate to make that happen. Okay, so you don't have any problem with that being a condition of approval then? No, we don't. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Thank you, Mr. President. Anybody else like to speak? Noting none, I'm going to close the public hearing. What's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move to approve PB 08-45 with findings of fact, uh, staff recommendations, modifications included in the case analysis, and the following condition, that the dilapidated structure located on proposed lot 101, section 5, shall be demolished prior to submittal of the final plan. Okay, have the motion. Second. A second. Commissioner O'Neill, second. Any more discussion on it? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Woody. <laughs> Item number seven, public hearing in action on PV 09-24, Jarvis Landing. Request to establish a 15.3 acre residential multifamily overlay district. Property is located at 7400 Caratoak Highway, approximately 750 feet north of Case Landing Road, tax map 110, parcel 74, Poplar Branch Township. Mr. Woody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this request is for RMF overlay um, and currently or presently the, the property is on conditional district general business. Um, and I'm going to go through real quickly. Probably the first thing I can do is go through the, kind of the history of this, of this particular property, the recent history. Um, in 1989, it was on residential R. In April of 2006, a sketch plan special use permit for a 14-lot residential subdivision was approved for the property. Um, the infrastructure was put in, and a final plat was approved in 2007. In the aerial photograph, you can see the road systems in, utilities are in. Uh, the property was rezoned in March of 2008 to allow 39 townhomes. That's when the GB zoning was added to the property. And this request before you tonight would be the next, I guess, the next step in that process or in their process, and that's a request for an RMF overlay, um, which is our multifamily overlay district the county <coughs> provides as a means for uh, affordable or workforce housing. Uh, what I want to do also is, is get into this a little bit and, and kind of show you the uh, zoning pattern that exists around this particular property. Um, again, the gray area or the subject property is zoned conditional district general business. And you can see it's adjacent to uh, GB that's on the road. And south of that, you can see large areas of general business. I think that was part of the context of what went into the GB approval for the property was the zoning context in the area. You can see Colonial Beach to the north of it that does have some smaller lots and a, and a little higher density than you typically see. Um, providing some context. Uh, and that brings us to tonight where what the request is is for RMF overlay. The RMF overlay has a density of about 4.3 units per acre. Um, that means conceivably, and I'm not, I don't think this is physically possible to fit, but it could accommodate up to about 60, 60 so uh, dwelling units. Um, I don't think that's the applicant's intention and I don't think that will fit on there, but that is the kind of density that RMF overlay creates. Um, this property is in the limited service designation of the land use plan. It's in the Jarvisburg sub area. Um, it's served by the Lower Currituck Volunteer Fire Department. It's in an X zone, so it's not in a flood zone, according to FEMA. Um, it actually has suitable soils for on-site septic system, good soil system there. Um, and I do want to mention before you tonight, there is a, a letter that was submitted by the applicant. It's from the, uh, the affordable housing group should be at your place and the applicant requested that I pass it out to you, to the board to become part of the record and I think he'll review that as part of his presentation. So this is, this project is supported by the North Carolina Housing Affordable Group. Um, and of course, you know, we're all concerned about providing housing for our workers in Curry Tuck. However, in this particular case, staff is recommending denial of this request and that's primarily based on, on a couple of things. Uh, the land use plan is one. We don't think it's consistent with the policies of the land use plan. Uh, but I think more importantly, I don't the staff feels the RMF overlay is, uh, is not an appropriate zoning district for limited service areas on, in, our, in our county. Uh, we think the RMF overlay and the higher densities that are associated with it are more appropriate for our full service areas. So we just think this is kind of the wrong, a good idea, but maybe the wrong location for that idea. Um, staff also mentions in our case analysis, we have concern that the uh, our RMF overlay is intended to be applied in areas where there's existing services and infrastructure. We think this is a bit removed from those types of services such as Grandy would provide. And finally, uh, staff's concerned that establishing RMF overlay in the Jarvisburg sub-area 
um, down in limited service area may actually increase demand for county services and, and encourage strip development in this part of the county. And, and you know, the land use plan, the focus of that is, 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 to, is to target our higher density growth, such as RMF overlays, into our full service areas. And so staff just doesn't feel like this fits, um, fits that policy construct. The planning board heard this case at their meeting uh, last month. At, at that meeting, they did recommend for unanimous denial of this as well. Um, I'd be happy to answer, in, answer any questions the board has at this time. Excuse me. Any questions of Mr. Woody at this time? Can you uh, explain to what exactly is the affordable housing group? It's a nonprofit out of out of Charlotte, North Carolina, that I think advocate advocates for affordable housing options. Um, I'd have to probably defer to the applicant to give you more detail than that. Again, this is just a letter I provided on their behalf at their request, so I, I don't know a lot about them. Okay, it's not a, uh, not affiliated with North Carolina. I don't, I don't think so, no, sir. Any other questions for the public hearing? All right, I'm going to open the public hearing. We have two people signed up. If you'll come forward and state your name and address for the record. The first one is Eddie V. Bobby Viesso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Eddie Valdivieso. I'm with Quibble and Associates, and I'm here on behalf of uh, GOB LLC, the owner of the property. Uh, ben had an excellent overview of the project. The, the crux of our request is density. Um, the staff case analysis cited the land use plan primarily as a reason for the recommendation for denial, and that being the limited service district does not support or recommend uh, a density that we're trying to get to. Um, the land use plan itself, as I've stated on numerous occasions, is a policy. And as I've seen on numerous occasions, if a project is supported, we can we can find reasons in here. If a project is not supported, we can find reasons in here. Um, that's more of a side note than anything. One of the items that the, the land use plan clearly states is a goal of the county is to encourage the development of affordable housing. And th the issue here is there's no vehicle available in the, in the current zoning ordinance that provides a density to where our project um, can get to affordable rate. And we're targeting a density here. We're trying to get to a density of 50 homes. We've got 39 currently permitted. Uh, I want to also, uh, as I did at the plan board, uh, make one clarification. There is a special use permit currently issued on the property for 39 townhomes. We're not changing that at all. That special use permit is still there. What we're asking for tonight is the RMF overlay zoning district to, to go over top of that. And the reason we're asking for the RMF overlay zoning district is because it is the last zoning tool left in the ordinance where we can get a density, potential density, of higher than three units per acre. Uh, there used to be a PRD option which has been taken off the books. Uh, there was some movement for affordable housing density bonus type ordinance uh, which failed and um, the number simply for this project to target uh, a rental uh, between five hundred six hundred fifty dollars a month uh, we need to get up another eleven home sites to make those numbers work uh, the land use plan was in place when the special use permit was granted for the special for excuse me for Jarvis Landing and the 39 townhomes and in the case analysis of that project land use plan policies were used to support that project um, yes we're coming in and asking for a higher density the density currently with the special use permit is I think 2.6 units per acre if we get to our target um, it'll be 3.2 units per acre it will be an increase and the RMF overlay uh, will allow up to uh, that there's a potential for 60 units on this property. Um, I have not evaluated uh, whether this property could support that. Um, one of the aspects of being affordable is it, uh, the concept is duplex homes, something of that nature, with individual septic systems uh, so that as buildings are needed, they can pull a building permit and build those uh, and not have the cost up front of a central sewage system for larger projects, for example, for a PRD or um, I believe the, your multifamily project in Moyoc was based on a central sewage system. 
as well. Here, to keep the costs down, um, we're dealing with conventional wastewater disposal on a site that has excellent soils. Uh, then mention about infrastructure or services. Uh, the site has excellent access to 158. It's got an improved road in there. You saw that on the aerial. Uh, water has already been brought into the property. The zoning, underlying zoning uh, supports the RMF request. Um, really, that's the crux of our request. Tonight, I've also got uh, Pete Kaufman, who's a representative of the owner as well. Uh, Mr. Kaufman has developed, his group has developed Coin Jock Meadows, which I think may be the only pseudo affordable project that we brought to the county that's uh, actually showing some construction out there. Um, these guys are experts in that side of it, and I'm going to let him talk about the affordable housing group unless you have any more questions for me, Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Next person's uh, Peter Kaufman. My name is Pete Kaufman, and I uh, work for Ocean Builders. I'll be representing the owner tonight. And Ben did a pretty good job of talking about the history of this project. I'd just like to add a few things to it. Um, as he stated, we do have 39 units already approved for the project. Uh, we got involved with this about a year ago with the current owner. Um, he purchased the property after it was uh, approved for the 39 units and was under the understanding he could do a, a market rate for sale project. Um, that wasn't the case. The, the project just wasn't financially viable. And he was left with the property the way it was. We got involved. We had some experience, as, as Eddie said, with developing workforce housing at Coin Jack Meadows. We looked at the project and thought uh, this could be a good candidate for a for rent affordable housing project. We have a good relationship with the Outer Bank CDC. The Outer Bank CDC introduced us to the Affordable Housing Group. And the Affordable Housing Group is a nonprofit corporation based out of Charlotte. They're not affiliated with the government. They have been around for about 40 years, and their mission is to provide affordable workforce housing, and they have projects throughout North Carolina. The closest one they have is in Elizabeth City, and they worked with the uh, Albemarle uh, CDC to get that one developed. Um, density is a, is a major issue on this project. We put together a tax credit application, and that's how that's how these projects are funded. The state sets aside a certain amount of tax credit dollars. Um, certain projects get together, they, they apply for these dollars, and there's a competition. And every, every development is held to the same standards. And um, what we found out from our application is 39 units just wasn't going to make us competitive with the other projects. Um, we, need, we needed a density bonus. Our first um, attempt, which I believe you guys uh, talked about maybe several meetings ago, a couple months ago, was to draft an affordable housing ordinance that would allow a density bonus if you were going to provide affordable housing. Unfortunately, I think that ordinance just got a little bit too confusing, and um, it's currently tabled. I don't know if it's still viable, but uh, th that was our attempt to try to get through the process. Um, we didn't get it approved in time for the application. Our application was rejected based on 39 units. It just doesn't, the, the math isn't going to work on that. Um, several months ago, we came back and, and um, uh, read our other options, and we said, well, let's try the RMF overlay. That's going to give us the density that we need. The RMF overlay was supposedly put out there to help affordable housing. And that's what we're going through right now. Um, our project, I'll talk a little bit about the project. Um, I don't want to call it a project because it's not. It's a, it's a nice neighborhood. Um, but we're going to have two and three bedroom townhomes. It's not going to be a big clustered building. Uh, they're going to be spread out all over the street. Um, 
to do the tax credits, there's a there's a high level of construction standards that we're held to. They, they mandate room sizes, uh, building materials, and the cost to build these things is much higher than market rate uh, housing. Drives up the construction cost, which once again drives up the need for the density. Um, the rents are going to be 550 to 650 for a two bedroom and a three bedroom apartment. They are going to be truly affordable to the people here. Um, it's not, um, it is not Section 8 housing. Um, the people that rent here have to have jobs, they have to have good credit. It's for workers, not for um, people on assistance. The affordable housing group is going to be the developer and the owner of this project. The current owner will, will not be involved in the ownership, he will not participate in it. And the affordable housing group is a nonprofit, it's not run for a profit. Um, there's no money to be made here. Um, they will have a full-time property manager to manage the property. They have staff in Charlotte that travels to all their uh, developments all over the state. They inspect it. They maintain a high level of quality in these in these uh, uh, neighborhoods. Um, I want to say a few things about the owner too. Um, the current owner of the pro property has, in the, in the last three or four years, made a significant investment in Great Duck County. He has um, several developments on the mainland that he's working on. In fact, you'll see another one here probably in a few months, um, right down the street. He's got some uh, investment up in Corolla. Um, we're now currently doing a, a lot of work up at the Corolla Lake Town Center, uh, getting a lot of, there's a lot of older buildings up there getting those um, improved. And Crawl Lake Town Center has 26 apartments. They provide uh, housing for at least 50 of the, of the workers up in Crawl. And without that, uh, without Crawl Lake Town Center, uh, businesses would not be able to function up there. And, and he is putting, I can tell you, a significant amount of money in that, in that uh, property up there. Uh, he's also been very generous with the community. He's got a foundation that's donated tens of thousands of dollars to Curry Tuck, to the Outer Banks. Um, and he's in a bad situation right now. He, he overpaid for this property. Um, he will never make money on Jarvis Landing. I can, I can tell you that right now. Um, I think right now we have, we, Curry Tuck has the ability to benefit from Mr. Pinto's um, loss here. Uh, he's willing, if we, he's not going to sell this to uh, another developer and, and take advantage of it. He's willing to put this thing out there to the public good, to the affordable housing group, to let them take this thing and move it forward and actually get something good for the county. Um, the, uh, at the planning board meeting, there was some opposition. Uh, from one of the families that originally sold the land to uh, the previous developer. And uh, Mr. Pinto and I met with them a couple weeks ago and just <clears throat> wanted to find out what their concerns were. And I've been instructed right now to say that, you know, if they, if they object to what we want to do here, if they want to, uh, if they object to the additional units that, that we're asking for right now, Mr. Pinto does not want to upset the community um, he's willing to just retract the uh, the application right now if that's going to be an issue. He does not want he does not want this development to be a sore spot in the community. And um, last thing, I just want to I want to ask you uh, to to do this. Um, we you really don't know Ocean Builders that well. We have done I think a really nice project out there at Coin Jack Meadows. We started out making this thing affordable at Coin Jack Meadows. Uh, we have held our price point even with some of the difficulties. Uh, we have said what we we have done what we said we were going to do, and uh, with this project, uh, we'll do what we said we we're going to do here too. Thank you. Questions? Questions? questions. Uh, Peter, a couple of questions. 
<clears throat> Number one, you, ma you made the statement that you're not going to rent to Section 8 housing applicants. How are you going to do that and not discriminate against those people? Well, that is not our, our intent is not to. But you, you cannot. We can't prevent that. You can't prevent that. No, but, but there is an application process that, that they can, uh, for example, uh, we've talked about going to the county employees first and, and filling up the applications uh, with county workers. Um, but when I said that, uh, the intent is not to, the, the pro forma is not built around Section 8 housing, and, and that will not be the... Well, but you, you, can't, you cannot deny those people. Uh, an app, they, ha they have the right to apply just like any other citizen, and we have a lot of those people in our county. A lot of those people qualify because they're, they're single moms, single dads out of work with kids. Well, and, and, and that's that's their only recross. Well, that I, I'm going to be right up front with you. Uh, I'm going to have a problem with the neighborhood, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to withdraw this application at this time because I'm going to support the people that I made the decision when I was on this board and originally approved the plat of this property to the owners, and I'm going to stick by my decision. And you just made the statement that you would withdraw it, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that at this time. I, I, uh, are you saying that the property owners are objecting to it? Yes. Sir. If they do, we, we will withdraw. Uh, that's that's your prerogative to do that at this time. Okay. Um. I'm the Jason property owner to the north, Johnny Crowley, 125 Alamo Street. Please come to the mic. Okay. Sorry. My name is Johnny Crowley. Uh, I live at 125 Alamo Street. The adjacent property to the north. I wholeheartedly object to this plan, project, however you want to call it. If we got people unemployed, as the commissioner had already stated, uh, that need housing, however, there's empty homes every day. I drive past in, just in my neighborhood in the immediate vicinity next to this area that are empty, that are bank foreclosed, they got signs on their door, and these are affordable homes. Uh, that's what the people we need to encourage. I believe we need to encourage in the county is that type of thing. You know, instead of putting these people in a rental home, let's see if we can't get them in a real home, something that can build a stronger family foundation on something that's a little more solid than a rental type environment. Something that people can grow for their generation on. Uh, they're not going to go anywhere with a rental type situation. Uh, so I object. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Anybody else? I have a comment. This young lady likes to go ahead. Come forward. State your name and address for the record. Hi, I'm Kristen Fraley, um, adjacent landowner. Um, and I just want to say one thing. I don't think that the county nor the citizens of this neighborhood um, here and wide um, should be penalized for someone's overpayment. I think they should have done their homework and their research before they came to us and wasted our time. That's Thank all I have you. to say. Well, first of all, I, I would like to uh, commend Ocean Hill, as a matter of fact, the Coin Jock Meadows. I've been through that project, and I think they did an excellent job with that. It's well thought out. Do you know offhand you know, how sales are going there? Are they moving much brighter? Yeah, we, we've actually got three going up right now, so Good. It's, we're getting okay. very And good the, re the reason I ask that, you know, because that is a quality neighborhood. It has good visibility. It makes a good impression when you come into it. The primary concern I would have with a project like this particular one, I understand you got 24 feet of frontage on 158, and it's off the road, and to have a rental property with that many units off the road where it's not readily visible to me just speaks of all kinds of problems with uh, law enforcement, public safety, and other things. You know, I, I can understand why some of the neighbors may have concern about it. And I'm not stereotyping the type of people there because Gosh knows we really need some affordable housing here, but uh, listening to the Board of Commissioners for, for the past few years and finally being part of it myself, uh, I have seen the situation come up where, you know, we have been very resistant to becoming a service area for the adjacent county down there, which unfortunately I, I foresee the lower end of the county perhaps uh, becoming at some point in time. But I don't think we're ever moved to uh, really encourage that sort of thing. I, I certainly can't bring myself to support a project like this down there. We did a, uh, actually the Affordable Housing Group 
commissioned a needs assessment study for the area. Uh, they specifically excluded Dare County, and this was done in March of this year. Um, there is a need in Curry Tuck for this, and th this thing will will fill. Uh, uh, it'll fill up within three months. There is. Uh, well, there, there is a definite need for this thing, and I don't. Our, our study said it's not going to come from. From Dare, people from Dare County aren't going to move up for this thing. It's it's within the county right now. Um, right. Also, the we're not here to talk about the the site plan that we're proposing, um, but the plan that has been approved. The housing is is spread out along the road. There's a lot of road frontage. It will be uh, easily patrolled um, by uh, by the police. We'll have a full time. Uh, Property manager on site. Uh, it's not going to be uh, unattended. Uh, it's just 24 foot here on the on the highway. I'm just saying the uh, interior. Road. Right now, there's there's police that go back there now. I mean, okay. I've seen them back there several times. Well, thank you, Mr. Coff. I well, need to ask Mr. McRae a question. Can he withdraw it at this point? Um, he could ask for withdrawal. I don't think that you have to honor that request. You may take action on this matter, which is before you on your agenda. Okay. My comment on this is this was originally the family work with the original developer, and I think 14 lots were approved. Is that correct? It was going to be a really nice subdivision. Then at some point in time, it turned to 39. And, and the has no reflection on you or anything, but every time we approve something in this county, everybody keeps coming back saying, if you'll just give me this, I can build houses and they'll be affordable. Then after they get that, they come back and say, if you just give me this more, I can make them affordable and we can do this great thing for Curry Tuck County. But I have yet to see one of them happen, except for the one there in Coin Jock. But every person that comes to the board, the standard procedure now is if you just give me this extra density, we're going to make it affordable. And after a while, what are we going to have? I mean, we're not going to have anything, but everything will be, quote, affordable, but I don't see it happening. But it's always if we just get a little more density, we're going to be affordable. And you guys are just killing us because you won't give us that so we can be affordable. And that's a recent phenomenon. Everything that comes to the board now, there's nothing that's just a subdivision. Everything is you got to do a little more for us. And, and you know, after a while, the folks are out here saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? You start out at 14, you go to 39, now you, if we grant this overlay, regardless of your special use permit, you can come back and ask for that total if it's 65, you can come back and be within the rules and the regulations, and we got to grant it. You can tell me 50 all night long, but if you want 65, you can come back with it, and if it fits on the property, we've got to approve it because you meet the legal requirements. That's where our problem runs. If people would just come from the first out the gate and say, this is what we want to do, then everybody in the county could judge what you want to do, we could make a decision and it'd be done, but it never happens anymore. So well, that, that's that's how this originally started. We we did we did it at the yep. request back when it was what it originally was. But the problem has been is that the property sold two more times, and the price has gone up. And just as Mr. Kaufman said, they paid too much money for the property, so they've got to make it sixty instead of thirty-nine units in order to make it work. Can I say something um, real quick? We're we're not trying to. The density has nothing to do with trying to recoup the overpayment on this. The density is to allow the tax credit application to happen to let the affordable housing group do what they need to do. The current owner is going to take a bath on this thing regardless. So it's not, it can stay at 39, it can go to 60, it doesn't. He's not going to make a dime on this on this property. Thank you, Mr. Coffin. Anything else? We'll close the uh, public hearing. The board has an option here, either let him withdraw it or we take action. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to deny PBO 924 due to its inconsistency with the policies, policies and limited designation 
of the 2006 land use plan and that the request is not reasonable, that it's not in the public best interest, and it does not promote orderly growth and development. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Nell, saying by Commissioner Taylor. Any further discussion? Noting none, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. For denial. Thank you. Item number eight, presentation and discussion on updating the county's hazard mitigation plan. Mr. Chairman, it's uh, interesting, I guess, that this, this item is going to be on you the night we discuss the Constitution and Mr. Rohr's comment, but this is a project that, uh, that although the federal government can't dictate to the state they, or to the local government, they certainly do and stuff. And in order for the county governments to be able to participate in public assistance if there's ever disaster declared in our county, uh, FEMA does put some strings with those funds. Uh, and one of the things they do require is that each jurisdiction has, needs to have a hazard mitigation plan. Uh, we have one, and it's time for it to be updated. And tonight, uh, Mary Beth Noons, our emergency management director, is here uh, with one of our interns, uh, Lauren Turner, and they're going to go over the process and talk about our hazard mitigation plan. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, September is National Preparedness Month. So um, if you go on a, one of the government-sponsored sites, uh, ready.com, uh, you'll see that there's a preparedness tip each day this month. And today's tip happens to be um, working together. Caratech County's hazard mitigation plan is due for an update, and working together is exactly what it's going to take. As we all know, Caratech County is faced with many natural disasters, and we need to plan for more than just our initial response. <clears throat> Hazard mitigation means sustained actions taken to reduce or eliminate long-term risk to people and property from hazards and their effects. In October 2000, the President signed the uh, Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 into law. It amended the Robert T. Stafford uh, Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistant, excuse me, Ex Assistance Act to streamline the um, administration of disaster relief to control the federal costs of disaster assistance. Among its many features and supporting re regulations, the Act established a requirement that all states and local governments have a hazard mit mitigation plan approved by FEMA. In order to remain eligible for many forms of federal pre- and post-disaster assistance, federal emergency response and recovery operations in the wake of a disaster would not be affected. But if Currituck County does not have a hazard mitigation plan approved by the deadline, it will lose eligibility for federal disaster assistance funds that help communities pursue important hazard mitigation activities and funding for, res for restoring <coughs> damaged public facilities. These, um, these programs include the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program, the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Program, the Repetitive Flood Claims Program, and the Severe Repetitive Loss Program. Again, all these um, special programs would not be available to us if our plan um, falls out of um, compliance. Uh, not having an approved plan at the local level during a state-declared emergency would leave us unable to apply for uh, the state assistance, except for Category A, which is individual assistance, and Category B, which is um, emergency protective measures. Our 2004 hazard mitigation plan continued to evaluate the nature and extent of the vulnerability to the effects of natural hazards. It was then submitted to FEMA where it was approved in April 2005. FEMA requires our plan to update every five years to remain eligible for mitigation grant after a declared disaster. There's an importance to having a working hazard mitigation plan other than being mandated by FEMA. A uh, functional hazard mitigation plan will create a disaster-resistant re community. The ultimate goals here should be to save lives, reduce damage to property, reduce economic loss, resume government and community operations quickly, and a shorter recovery time. So as we begin the process, we will update hazards, update our historical and GIS information, 
at new critical facilities, and most importantly, we will evaluate the goals set in 2005, determine which goals were achieved, and if they are not, we'll ask each other why, and figure out if they were not obtainable, or if we simply needed more time to complete the project. And uh, we need to take that information and work that into a plan to attain new goals for the next five years. I've been given a great opportunity for some extra help getting this project up and going. Lauren Turner is an ECU student majoring in criminal justice with a minor in homeland security. And she'll be interning with us for her uh, final semester and will graduate this December. I would like to invite Lauren up at this time to talk about the Hazard Mitigation Planning Team. Thank you. And I have to say I'm honored to be working for Kirkwood County again. Um, now she's outlined a little bit um, about the, what the Hazard Mitigation Plan is and why it's important to Kirkwood County. Um, I wanted to just talk about how we're actually planning to do this process. Um, the committee that will be working mainly on this project will be our already established um, LEPC, our Local Emergency Planning Committee. Um, we decided to go with a committee that had already been established. They've already worked together. Um, they've worked with hazardous materials in our area, so they know what's already here, and that knowledge will help them in implementing this plan as well. Um, it's also an excellent cross-section of um, our county's departments, law enforcement, emergency personnel. Um, it also uh, has citizens on the committee that represent not only Curry Tuck, but Knott's Island and Corralo as well. So that helps us um, get a more diverse overall view of our community opinions within the county. Um, we also have supporting members um, inside of our local government. We have our geographic information systems personnel. Um, they're going to help us provide a visual representation of our county's critical structures, where those vulnerabilities lie, as well as our mapping assistance. Um, the planning department um, will help us with the knowledge of flood zones. And also, the hazard mitigation plan is also involved in other policies that Curry Tuck has already implemented, including uh, the CAMEL plan and the land use plan. Uh, they're integrated together, so it's important that we have the input from the planning department so we can keep everything up to date. Um, three other members, um, myself included, I will be attending all the meetings and providing any assistance that I can. Jeffrey Klein is our Piedmont Natural Gas representative. Um, he's going to be helping us out as far as um, knowing where all of our gas lines are and the information that the public can't receive, but because he will be on our committee, we'll be able to obtain that information. Um, James Peel is the chief of our regional response team, and he's going to be an asset because in the event of um, we need a hazmat team, he's the one that responds. So that knowledge will help us uh, with this hazard mitigation plan. Um, public participation is a huge part of um, how we're going to put this plan together. Um, we are planning to involve the public in several ways, not only um, by having several citizens on our committee. Um, we're also in the process of constructing a survey instrument on our website that uh, will provide a number of questions that the citizens can go on at any time, regardless if they can't make a meeting, can't uh, come by our office to provide input on what they think is important in regards to our hazards that um, the county faces. Um, the updated plan after we complete this uh, five-year renewal, will um, a draft of that will be available not only in emergency management office, but also in our uh, all the libraries that we have in the county, um, including Corrala. Um, two open public meetings during the drafting and approval stage, not also um, the um, open hearings as we are today, but um, two open public community meetings where we can talk and uh, collaborate together on what we think is important and how the citizens um, feel about the hazards that they're facing. Um, we also simply will have a suggestions drop box at emergency management. Um, you know, for convenience reasons, if you don't have time, 
drop a note by and we'll try to keep that in consideration. Um, our hazard mitigation planning team, um, you know, with the assistance of uh, our planning department, our GIS department, our planning team, um, our goal is to hold as many meetings as possible um, during the time period that we have. Uh, the critical members of the committee and the participating uh, citizens from the community. Uh, with their input, um, we're going to try to review the existing documents, goals, and the past action mitigation projects and determine whether they were effective or not and determine why not. Was it funding? Was it uh, a lack of communication between the departments? Um, just evaluate those and see what we can do better. Uh, we're going to come together to also determine new goals, strategies, and projects for the next five years, um, pending uh, the citizens' participation on this as well. Um, we're also going to determine the feasibility of the actions proposed, how long they're going to take, and who's going to be responsible for initiating them. We're going to then prioritize these. Um, which actions are going to most benefit the county, cost-effectively, um, you know, we're not going to plan for something for a tsunami when we need to plan for something for a hurricane. So we're going to take those into consideration as well. Um, lastly, we're doing the best we can to make this an active document. Um, we want to continually update it all that we can. And um, so this planning team is going to be more than a one-time thing. Um, they're going to be currently revising everything uh, reviewing the implementation as well as proposed mitigation projects as well. <laughs> um, this is our uh, estimated time of completion. We're trying to get the completion of our rough draft to be by the end of November. Um, after we send the rough draft um, to the state, the uh, North Carolina Emergency Management, they will review it, send it back to us with any recommendations. Um, or changes that we have to make, uh, we'll then present the draft again to you all again, the Board of Commissioners for adoption. After the adoption of the plan, it'll be sent to FEMA, and um, in April 2010, if it is approved, um, we will be compliant with FEMA's new regulations and standards. Um, at any time, if uh, anybody has any questions about the plan, I'm at the office and I'm available. Mary Beth is also available and we'll be glad to assist any citizens, commissioners, anything with y'all might have questions on. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Okay. Got a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the board's pleasure? At this time, we're not requesting any particular action. It's part of the, the process. We have to uh, have a, a, a kickoff meeting, which we have just done, and this be brought back to you at a future date for your actual adoption. Okay. Do we get to read it? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Or somebody will read it to you. Okay. Depending on. A lot of big words. What's your name? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we encourage you to read it. <laughs> okay. Item number nine appointment and jury commission. Move to reappoint Miss Dorothy Jones. Second. Motion to reappoint Dorothy Jones. And second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item number 10, consent agenda. <coughs> Move for approval. We have a motion to recommend approval. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Commissioner's report. No. I vote no on this, Jim. Okay, six to one now. Uh, Ms. Taylor, we'll start with you, Commissioner's report. Um, no, just to uh, reiterate the fact that um, lay off some water and we need help as soon as we can get it. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Mr. Gregory? No, I don't, I don't, I'll just remind people again of the wildlife festival this weekend. 12 and 13. Sorry, so. Mr. Idler? A couple things. Uh, the Nine Silent Roots and Club will be holding the first annual Oyster Roast on October the 3rd. Tickets are for sale by routine members. I have some. If anyone is interested, uh, we would love to have you. Uh, Don't you buy us one? Sorry. 
you said you had to work for a living, so you can get off, off some of that money. Okay. And the second thing is, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the county staff for all their efforts in helping me with this service district. Uh, they were valuable, their expertise, uh, their, their trustworthiness with the people played a big part in this thing being successful. And, and I personally want to thank each and every one of you, Mr. McCree and Dan and, and Ben and, and uh, everybody who participated. Thank you. Mr. Nels. Yeah, I want to thank everybody that helped with the ninth annual Outer Banks Bike Show in the county, of the volunteers that we had. We had a tremendous turnout. The good Lord gave us the best weather we've had in nine years. I got four phone calls from business owners in Curry Tech County that told me that they profited tremendously from the uh, thousands and thousands of bikes that came here. Uh, I want to especially thank publicly the U.S. Coast Guard that actually did fly over Saturday and Sunday. Sunday they did it with also with the addition of the H-60 helicopters. Uh, they came so close and turned up that we could actually read the name badges on those guys, and they were very, very proud, and we must have had 50 or 60 people that had American flags. It made us all feel very, very good in these hard economic times that uh, those the, that number of people that would show up, uh, I can't remember the exact figures, but... In one event, we raised 3000 The other one, we raised about $4,000. Uh, and, and all of that goes to the terminally ill children uh, that uh, reside for two weeks in Randleman, North Carolina. I would also like to give the public an explanation, and I, would, uh, I don't know how many of the board members know what we just voted on in that consent agenda or not, but there were a number of items in there that I talked to the finance officer about. And one was... I mean, basically what you just approved was a $978,383 item under one, and another item that was $593,647, uh, an appropriation for new money that I actually knew nothing about until today. And that was the reason for uh, uh, my negative vote. It was not that I was against any particular program, uh, but simply that um, I had no prior knowledge. I don't know how the board knew about all these budget amendments, but uh, it was not at least um, provided to me. Thank you, sir. Mr. Orr. I'd just like to remind everybody to turn out and dunk uh, Chairman, <laughs> Chairman Etheridge and uh, Commissioner Nelms on uh, Saturday at the... Uh, got I Barry in it, too. He volunteered. I'm quite sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is your chance, Paul. Yeah, this <laughs> this is your chance. Time. Huh? I want to get you while you're dry. I don't want you after well, you his, his, his wife gave the time. So. Yeah, they're, they're published around the time. There's yeah. a lad from Walnut Island that showed up. If there. I remember correctly, without objection, I volunteered every commissioner. You're obligated to be there and sit on the dunking tank yourself. But we objected. Nobody <laughs> objected. We'll I, check I, the minute. I, 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 I think that'll fill up. Five 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 two. Two. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, 7, seven o'clock Saturday morning through uh, 4 o'clock. It's going to be a great lunch, too, so please show up and support ICO. Mr. Uh, O'Neill? I have two items. I don't, they're not necessarily commissioner's report, but they're two items I want to bring up. Uh, I had a phone call this women, this women, this weekend <laughs> from, from an elderly woman who alerted me of herself and, and some others that their water pumps are failing. They live right on the main highway. And these are elderly people. They're not young young people that can get out and work and do stuff. And they cannot afford to tap onto the county water system. And I've brought this up before, and it's usually kind of like a balloon with no air in it. But this county needs to have some kind of system where we have a sliding scale for people that have a fixed income or cannot afford and I'm talking about elderly people. I'm not talking about lazy people that just won't work. I'm talking about people that have paid their dues and they cannot afford water. They've got rusty water in their house. We've got a water system running right by them and this county cannot find a way to have a sliding scale based on income or a way to allow people to pay the tap fee other than um, all at once. I'm going to ask again for this board to again look at that and see if staff can find a way that we can do something to help some of these folks in this county. Um, you know, we talk about the price of everything going up. You look no further than Dare County. 
all the elderly folks and home folks in Dare County could no longer afford to live there because of the cost of everything in Dare County. Same thing is going to happen to Curry Tuck at some point in time. And I'm going to uh, continue to bring these issues up as they come to me from my constituents. The next issue is we received a letter from the ABC board telling us that they were willing to designate $200,000 a year to Curry Tuck County for any project that we deemed appropriate. And at this time, I would ask the board to entertain designating that money to the replacement of the animal shelter at uh, $200,000 a year. You can go out and take a short-term financial um, loan. You have $200,000 we did not have before, and we could solve the animal shelter problem in this county that continues to get worse by the day. So I'm going to throw that out there for the board, and I'm going to ask y'all to uh, either take an action yes or no on that. Put it on the next agenda. I'm making it as a motion right now. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any discussion? I think we need to know where it's, where it's going, what's the cost going to be, how much is it going to cost. There's a lot of, a lot of details. I'm just asking that this money be designated to it and the staff can bring us the rest of it forward. Any more discussion? What type of... Uh, Financing can we get for two hundred thousand dollars a year? A lot. I mean, but it, I mean, it depends on rate and term. I mean, do you three and a half percent for one year. Twenty so years? Did you say twenty years? Twenty years. <laughs> three and a half percent for twenty years. What's the market rate? It's market rate on bonds. Right? Oh, I'm sure you could buy. I mean, you can build a facility they requested at twenty years financing. Okay, so if we were shorter term, we would probably get the job done. Uh, to the degree y'all want to do it, yes. This is money that fell into our lap. It's not designated for nothing. Mr. Scan, all I'm asking you is to designate the money to it. He can bring the program back to us, where it's going to go, how much it's going to cost, then the board can vote on whether to approve it or not. Did they actually say they would have the money? Excuse me? Did the letter actually say they would provide the money? It, it said they would act upon any request that we sent to them, for which I which I assume that they would so scrutinize and and they could sure. they certainly could look at it as saying that if they disagree with you they would not fund it, but they would they entertain any request that you wanted to send them is, is the way I read the letter. But isn't that contingent upon approval by the L uh, ABC Commission? Uh, it is not. Is not. Is not. They they have discretion for their own funds. This this is they have discretion to maximize the amount allowed under the ABC laws to withhold as much working capital as the law allows, and that's what they're doing. They can push the working capital up to a million something, and they're saying that they would offer two hundred thousand dollars of that annually to a project that uh, uh, the board submitted to them for approval. Uh, Mr. O'Neill, would you entertain the idea of making your motion to? Ask them, will they specifically allocate that money to us? Contingent of them allocating that money for that specific project? Right. Yeah. Right. I'd support that. Okay, any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right, I am going to ask for a motion to recess this meeting and reconvene as the Tourism Development Authority to take care of some. Did everybody get started? I was the last one. I will say one thing. Uh, got more? I mentioned Friday is 9 11. There will be a special uh, program, I believe, at the Judicial Center in one of the courtrooms called Cry Out America from 12 to 1 and then there'll be that room will be open for prayers and other types of remembrances at that time. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, to note also that uh, um, a weekend ago we had a, a tragedy occurred on our beaches uh, where we had a young man that drowned uh -huh. and not only would I like to give recognition to all the different volunteers and county staff that participated, but uh, it did require that family to extend their stay here. And I'd like to recognize Sun Realty. 
uh, we called Sun Realty and was looking to see if we could find some accommodations so that mm. family could ex extend their stay here. Um, and Sun Realty was able not only to provide accommodation free of charge to the family, but they were able to uh, absorb or waive all uh, cleaning or incidental fees associated with that. So I certainly want to give them uh, credit for stepping up uh, in a big way. And it was a, a house owned by a gentleman named Robert Duffer. Uh, whose house was in Ocean Sands. I believe he actually is in Virginia, but uh, um, I just want to give them recognition for stepping up in, in, a, uh, in a terrible situation and helping those folks out. At our next meeting, without objection, have a resolution of yeah, appreciation sure. yeah. prepared for them. Yeah, I think it would be appropriate if the county send the, the property owner a, a we, we, letter of thanks. We, we, we've yeah. sent them a letter and we've sent them uh, um, a gift basket um, already thanking them for that, but I certainly want to recognize that. Bad tragedy. Yes. I'm glad that the realty company stepped up and then. It just shows there's good folks all over for it. Anything else, Mr. Scanlon? No, sir. Do we have a motion to recess this meeting? So moved. Okay. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, now we're going to reconvene as the Tourism Development Authority. Mr. Scanlon. Uh, you have for your consideration tonight, uh, I believe it's two budget amendments that were in your consent agenda as Board of Commissioners. They're in there also your agenda as uh, Tourism Development members. Okay, we have a motion to approve those two amendments. So, motion and a second. Any no more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Do we have a motion? Any other business to come before the TDA? No, sir, not tonight. Okay. A motion that we adjourn the TDA. Okay, is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Do we have a motion now to go into closed session uh, as advertised item 13 according to GS 143-318-112 subsection 4 to discuss economic development? And Mr. Chairman, if I may ask that you add uh, 143.318.1183 to reserve the attorney client privilege. So ordered. Uh, we have a motion to go into closed session for those items. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. aye.